invented them. But we have invented this, a micro-life, which is 30 minutes of life expectancy. Now, why a micro-life? Well, a young people in the audience, are there any young people here? A, a, young, a, a young person in their mid-twenties or so has got about 57 years left of life expectancy. 57 years is a million half hours. So, you know, a young person setting off, you know, deciding about their lifestyle, how they're going to live their life, um, has got a million half hours to live. So, you know, you, um, you watch the Eurovision Song Contest, that's six microlives gone, just like that, bam. <laughs> never, never to be repeated. So, so we're using up 48 a day, essentially, you know, as we're going towards our death at 48 a day. It's not quite, of course, because every day we survive, it pushes our life expectancy out a little bit. And the other side of it, of course, is that due to all this wonderful medical work you're all doing, life expectancy is growing at three months a year, and it has done for decades. So in a sense, we you know, use up our 48 a day, and then we get given 12 back again by all your wonderful work. We aren't so, because our life, our death is moving away from us at three months a year. Quite extraordinary. So um, how can we spend our micro-lives? Um, well, we can have a couple of cigarettes. Um, to a cigarette at about 15 minutes. Various calculations come out at 20, 11 minutes or 15. Ours was about 15 minutes. So two cigarettes a day. So uh, someone, an average, oh, someone who smokes 20 a day, uh, what's that? That's 10 microlives, that's five hours. So they're going towards their death at 29 hours a day, you know, rushing towards their death. Um, you can have a, about seven units of alcohol over and above drinking something. So this isn't from zero to seven units. This is from um, a, one unit a day up to... Um, up to eight units a day. So that's seven units of alcohol a day. Um, you can be, like I am, five kilograms overweight. And the latest PITO uh, meta-analysis of the effect of obesity on life expectancy puts five kilos per weight, overweight per day, as losing you about one micro-life. There's a hazard ratio of about 1.09. Um, now, e these are a bit more controversial, but if you believe the linear no-threshold theory for radiation exposure, having a chest x-ray is about three microlives, and if you're going to spend 800 quid on a whole body CT scan, what a bargain, you, get, you lose 180, <laughs> just like that. So, whoa, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now, oh yeah, I'm going to finish off with some maths. Yeah, come on, let's look at the maths. I, we've just been doing this work, I think it's really exciting, of trying to, how can we convert epidemiological studies, which are all in terms of hazard ratios, all this relative risk nonsense that nobody understands, how can we convert those to things that people might understand? And I think this is a lot simpler than you might think. There's some lovely work um, converting hazard ratios to life expectancy. And that was done by John Haybittle, a um, wonderful statistician, a few years ago. And he um, produced a nice formula. If we assume a particular form for survival, curve, Gompert survival, a hazard ratio, a daily hazard ratio of H, changes your life expectancy by round about 11 log H, or reduces your life expectancy by 11 log H, very simply. So roughly, a person in their 30s, and I've chosen this number deliberately, with a hazard ratio of 1.09, that's five kilos overweight, for example, expects to lose about one year in life expectancy when you put it in that formula, or about 18,000 microlives. But a person in their 30s has got about another 50 years to live, which is about 18,000 days. So in other words, being this five kilograms overweight every day is losing them one microlife per day. Now, this is really powerful because it means that if we look at the hazard ratio, every hazard ratio of 1.09 is losing us one microlife a day. So, for example, being male rather than female has got a hazard ratio of about 1.5. It's higher when the um, men are younger. But every day, a male has got a 50% chance, um, uh, higher, higher chance of dying than a female, an average female, in this country. And that's, that's just how it is, always has been, very constant. So that means that being a male, well, if you look at that 1.09 and we power it up, you lose about four microlives a day just by being male. So you're going towards your death two hours faster than a female, a similar female. Well, so, but we can't do much about that, really. That's, the way, that's just the way it goes. Um, it's really a bit of a shame, isn't it? But um, we can take studies like this. This is done by my colleagues at the um, Institute of Public Health. Lovely study on 20,000 people in the EPIC cohort in, in East Anglia where they came up with hazard ratios for all-cause mortality for these different behaviours. Now, this is very sim simplistic because it's just the behaviours present or absent. So, for example, being a smoker, they came out with a hazard ratio of 1.77. When you convert it using that formula, the Haybittle formula, you get that that's losing six microlives per day on average. 
Um, so it's about, about three hours. So it's, it's similar to the figure I came up with. It's equivalent to, I think, smoking about 12 cigarettes a day, which is the, about the average anyway. Alcohol, either not drinking at all or drinking more than 14 units a week, works out about 1.26, a hazard ratio of 1.26. So it's two and a half microlives per day being lost if you're, if you're drinking excessively in that way. Um, whereas if the good behavior, if you have your five a day, and so your uh, vitamin C level is greater than 50, 50 millimoles per liter, the hazard ratio is 0.69. It's gaining four microlives a day, two hours a day. You're saving off your, your, how fast you're rushing towards your death by eating your five portions of fruit and veg a day. And if you're active, greater than 30 minutes a day, that hazard ratio corresponds to 2.5, um, uh, which is about an hour and a quarter. So 30 minutes um, serious activity per day looks like it's gaining you an hour and a quarter in life expectancy. Now, you can't just multiply this up. If you exercise, because if you did, you exercise half the day, you'd live forever. No, I don't, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Just like, yeah, yeah, no, no, it doesn't work like that. But these are additive. Now, micromorts are not active, uh, um, additive. If you go and, um, you know, giving birth while on a motorbike or something like that, you can't just add these things up. Whereas these you can add up. Um, because the EPIC cohort found that these were largely, you know, these, these uh, factors were additive. So I can say that, you know, compared to the smoke and alcohol, you know, these, are cancel these will cancel each other out broadly if you have that behavior. Um, so uh, the feeling I got, what we're interested in is whether this is a, a way of perhaps communicating to people the in a more immediate way, rather than talking about long-term effects, the communication in terms of how fast you're living your life. It's another metaphor for risk. So I'm going to finish now, a bit early. Well, talk, some, talk among yourselves or something like that. I'm sure you, I'm sure you don't mind me finishing early. <laughs> I could go on for hours. But um, OK, to conclude then, um, what, what, have I, what have I said? Um, that, uh, this proper, I really believe there's uniform reporting of benefits and harms. The time has come. People, I came to a talk in this lecture theatre about 20 years ago saying we should be doing this. But it really is starting to, to be taken seriously. It's absolutely about time. It's infuriating if you can only get relative risks. You know, relative risks have got a role. They, know they are important. I want to know that as well. But it's not. They shouldn't. You should be able to get it in other ways. But there's no one size fits all. Multiple formats um, that, can, that can adapt to the individual. We're, we're doing some work with the um, British um, on the uh, JBS uh, three guidelines where the risk communication tool we're designing has got a, a set of little icons at the top. So you can, you can choose the complexity and subtlety of the communication message. If you just want to do something really simple, there's absolutely just a picture, one number on it, boom, you can get that. Or you can get survival curves and all sorts of stuff as well. So you can choose the complexity to fit the, the preferences of the individual. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that you know, this is, or the, while numbers are important, they are not everything. We have to acknowledge patient concerns. Even if those concerns are things that's not easy to put into numbers. And I think you should try to put do as much as you can to assess these are. So they can go in, in the facts box. They can be, they can be, um, they can be in there. And this, this other idea is that we, so often, not just with implants and things, face with deeper uncertainties. The day we don't know these risks. We don't know what's going on all the time. And we have to be open about that. We have to be transparent about that as well. And that requires a slightly different language, one beyond numbers and confidence intervals. It's a language, I think, of, of the robustness of the evidence. And that's why I welcome developments like the grade scale and recommend them. Um, OK, and I shall stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>